evening, and um, uh, we are, I am also very grateful and happy that David van der Swark has agreed to give the umbrella keynote for this conference. And David has worked for many years on legal governance and policy issues around endangered and, uh, endangered and economically important marine species. And he said that that's still what mainly drives him now. He's a professor of law and Canada Research Chair in Ocean Law and Governance in Dalhousie University. Uh, teaches environmental law, is the Associate Director of the Marine and uh, Environmental Law Institute, has a number of uh, research interests. And I think what's particularly interesting, uh, has worked on local, regional, and global law and policy frameworks for fishery management and protection of species. So law is a very much a sort of overarching framework is what I find particularly fascinating. And without further ado, thank you for agreeing, and, and David will talk to us on Well, thanks, Marian. Um, I should have probably said no to giving the um, keynote speaker uh, session here because of the huge topic that is, has to be addressed. The, um, Get going here. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, really what I've been asked to address is getting a grip on how science has influenced the quest for sustainable marine ecosystems. And that is not easy at all. Uh, partly because of governance complexity. Sustaining marine biodiversity depends on a complex mix of governance levels and decision making points under each where scientific information may be incorporated and often not incorporated. And so you go at the global level, obviously we have to mitigate and adapt to climate change under the Paris Agreement. Uh, we have to look at adding and controlling chemicals under the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. That could be another hour lecture. We're only regulating 28 chemicals out of over 90 million chemicals that have been created uh, by humans or discovered. So we're not doing very well. Listing and restricting trade in endangered threatened marine species under the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. Uh, and then the regional level. We have uh, around 44 or so regional fisheries bodies. About half of them have management responsibilities. And you know, again, to really understand how science is being translated or not, you have to look at these regional fisheries management bodies and what's happened under each of them. That will take probably 45 days to do that. And then you have the whole regional seas programs, 18 of those around the globe. And some of them, again, look at setting standards for pollution on the regional level. And then you get into the national level. 150, over 150 coastal states, each with its own complex approaches and challenges in law and policy, regulating fisheries and aquaculture, setting pollution standards, permitting offshore oil and gas operations, designating and implementing MPAs, determining national greenhouse gas emission targets and measures and adaptation responses. Whoa. And then you get into the scientific complexity. And I've been interested to hear about all this scientific complexity. It's out there, uncertainties. And it's just hard to even keep track of the fragmented array of marine scientific bodies, programs, projects, and assessments. I mean, at the global level, we all know we have the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And we have this uh, quite recent Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform of Biodiversity Ecosystem Services, trying to create this big global assessment by 2019. And of course, you have a UN regular process for global reporting an assessment of the state of the marine environment. We had our first assessment, now we're working on the second assessment. And then if you just go UN Division of Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea, they compiled a list a few years ago of over 150 marine-related assessments at the global and regional levels alone. And then at the national level, I can almost identify the NOAA fisheries people in the audience because they're the ones that look most stressed, I think. Um, you know, you know 100, around 450 stocks, stock complexes to be assessed with management advice, 102 endangered threatened species, 117 marine mammal species. Whoa. So you, know, you probably only need 45 years to go over to really what's all happy out there around the globe. Uh, and then you have the marine scientific literature explosions. Uh, a, use, a recent report from the UN, about 14,000 oceanography articles are published each year. And you look at the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, they did a synthesis report on ocean acidity a few years ago. They said we've seen a 20-fold increase in papers on ocean acidity. And I'm sure we're way above that now. And so I guess all this comes down to that when I thought about giving a keynote, I said, really, I think I have to look at a couple of images here and simplify it. And so the images I've come up with, and I think this is pretty accurate, I call it tacking, 
we're tacking forward because we do see incremental progressions for biodiversity, conservation, sustainable use. And they're evident at the international level. We've adopted cer certain key legal principles. We are setting marine biodiversity ag related agendas through U UN processes. And we're addressing marine biodiversity through conventions. And very quickly, I'll cover some of that ground. But then there's the sea of governance challenges. Uh, international is still struggling on numerous fronts, putting sustainability principles into practice, taking climate change and ocean acidity seriously. The scientists know what's going on pretty well, where the trends are at least, but you just don't see it really being translated yet effectively at the international level. And then strengthen the conservation of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Again, that could be a two-hour lecture in its own. So I'll try to keep the time. And I'm going to keep an eye on my watch. And I'll try to finish enough for some questions. And again, I think, Andre, you set maybe a, uh, a Woods Hole record for one of the fastest PowerPoints. But I think I'm going to beat you on this. Uh, so don't blink, because you may miss a slide. Uh, because I will go very fast because of the uh, great scope that has to be covered here this morning. So a two-part speed cruise will follow. This is not my own personal vessel. Uh, I only have a 14-foot fisherman with an eight-horsepower Evinrude at home, but this is where it's going to be a speedy presentation. So, <laughs> progressions, tacking. You know, it's not clear sailing. We're tacking like this. So, some of the tacking, uh, we're tacking on three main fronts. Um, and so, one is the adoption of international legal principles. And I'm just going to focus on two of the primary ones that where science is particularly important. Precautionary approach, which of course is really what we should put in place when we don't have scientific certainty in particular. And then the ecosystem approach. I'm sure everyone here, I hope, has heard of the ecosystem approach. But that really is a driving, driving principle now that is probably driving a lot of the science, but also driving uh, international decision making and even national decision making. So precautionary principle approach. Um, it captures common sense notions, I think, pretty well in cultures around the globe. Um, you know, stitch of time saves nine. Look before you leap. Better safe than sorry. Um, and it provides critical guidance for making environmental related decisions. And the basic thrust is uh, where there's scientific uncertainty as to environmental effects of a proposed exploitation use, decision makers should err on the side of caution. So it's a very simple kind of principle. And it seems here to stay. I will guarantee you, I don't think it's going to go away. You see it now in over 50 international legally binding agreements and over 40 non-binding instruments. And I give you just a partial list. You, you find the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change already. You see it in the Convention on Biological Diversity. You get the FAO Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries, uh, our fish down in highly migratory fish stocks agreement, et cetera. And the Rio Declaration on Environment Development. That's not a treaty. It's a global set of principles that we adopted at the Earth Summit in 1992. So it's well entrenched. And just to keep it simple, the most powerful versions of precaution include a couple of things, burden of proof reversal uh, and precautionary prohibitions. Just to explain a little bit, placing the burden on proponents to develop the change is one major approach, and it's very strong. If you're a lawyer, you know this probably decides most cases. Uh, and the basic idea is no approval should be granted unless the proponent of development or like fisheries or aquaculture, whatever it is, establish some standard of safety acceptability. And you can set those standards differently. It could be under national legislation. It could be done by policy. No significant damage to the marine environment. No serious and reversible harm to marine biodiversity. No unreasonable adverse effects on the marine environment. It could also just say, we need more science before we're going to allow you to go ahead. We need better science. Uh, we need better management to be put in place. So this could all, you know, different ways you can set this up. But somehow you, you put a burden there on someone who wants to go ahead to show some standard of acceptability or safety. And establishing prohibitions. You know, you want to be precautionary, <laughs> you can put prohibitions in place. Uh, don't allow non-indigenous species to be introduced. Don't bring your Atlantic salmon over to the Pacific where they have escaped and they continue to escape. Uh, no import or production of genetically modified organisms. You know, just don't allow it. If you go forward, then you're going to have a lot of questions about risk and measuring that risk. Uh, and strong versions of precaution have been adopted on occasion in rather narrow circumstances in international fisheries management. i just give you a few examples. FEO through the International Guidelines for Management of Deep Sea Fisheries on the High Seas in 2008. They call on states and regional fisheries management organizations arrangements to close vulnerable marine ecosystems 
until appropriate conservation and management measures have been adopted to prevent significant adverse, adverse impacts to ensure long-term conservation, sustainable use of deep-sea fish stocks. So we've seen that then go in place where you can't go out and fish there on these VMEs until we have management measures, uh, or maybe they'll never have management measures. We never want to open up at all. Uh, and strong precautionary coach has also been extended to the Central Arctic Ocean. I don't know how many people have been watching this go on, but in 2015, actually, the five Arctic coastal states adopted a declaration on potential high seas fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean. There's no commercial fisheries up there yet. And they said, look, let's put in place a precautionary moratorium. We're not going to authorize fishing vessels to conduct fishing up in this large area of the Central Arctic Ocean until one or more regional, sub-regional fisheries management organizations have been established. And we have to have more science. So they actually put in place a beginning of a scientific program to gather the science and find out what's up there ecologically. We, we know so little about the Central Arctic Ocean. And just to kind of finish the picture, the Arctic Five expanded the this fisheries negotiations now, really, discussions to include uh, China, Japan, South Korea, Iceland, and the EU. And there's going to be, a, hopefully, a final negotiation session in Washington, D.C. at the end of uh, November of this year, where we may get an actually new legal treaty looking ahead, trying to prevent fishing before it occurs. The only, I think, place in the world that's pretty well happened, where you put something in place before it happens. So it's a very precautionary approach that's being taken. And then just show you back on the national level, of course, uh, the, uh, federal, uh, at the federal level, the North Pacific Fishery Management Council in the US has imposed a precautionary moratorium for commercial fisheries uh, off the Alaska coast there, uh, pursuant to their 2000 Arctic Fishery Management Plan. And the moratorium is in effect until further scientific information is available on what is up there and what the ecosystem impacts may be of fisheries. And, and Canada's, by the way, done a similar kind of a moratorium on its side in the Beaufort Sea. But you also get weaker versions of precaution. And FAO Code of Conduct urges adoption of precautionary approach. Absence of, absence of adequate scientific information should not be used as a reason to postpone or failing to take conservation and management measures. Precautionary reference points should be established based on best scientific evidence available. Target reference points, limit reference points. And for newer exploratory fisheries, states should adopt cautious conservation and management measures, including catch and effort limits. A UN Fish Stocks Agreement of 1995 that's a binding treaty that deals with tunas and your straddling stocks that go from national waters into high seas waters uh, around the globe. Again, they call for setting precautionary limit reference points, conser th conservation thresholds that should not be exceeded to ensure harvesting is within safe biological limits. They say maximum sustainable yields should be regarded as the minimum standard for limit reference points. And an example would be setting a precautionary level for spawning stock biomass below which it should not fall. Just as an aside, they have a whole annex on setting these reference points. And they're really quite open-ended. I mean, they're, they're not very specific. And maybe that's a good thing because we've heard already, you know, the advances that are taking place in modeling, multi-species modeling. So it does open up the whole world to kind of have a new approach to setting these reference points. Um, re target reference points intended to meet management objectives. They don't give examples of types of management objectives given. Example might be setting a target by returning the stock biomass to a healthy historical level. And precaution reference points shall be used to trigger pre-agreed conservation and management actions. For example, recovery plan where a stock stalls, falls below a limit reference point. So that's the international binding treaty uh, that we see. And then coming now to the ecosystem approach, uh, again, this has emerged obviously from various international sources. We have a 1982 law of the sea convention, considered our constitution of the oceans. It doesn't mention ecosystem approach because that really came later in thinking, but you actually go into a number of their uh, articles and you see actually it's implicit. Uh, Article 192, states have the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. We have hardly begun to see the fundamental importance of that principle. Think of what preservation means. We shouldn't let the ice melt in the Arctic, right? Preserve it, I think. Think what that means to climate change. And how are you ever ever given much consideration to the force of this principle if you actually, or the Arctic, if you take it seriously? Article 206 states required, uh, are to require environmental impact assessments, proposed activities that may cause substantial pollution or significant harm to the marine environment. And then on the fisheries side, Article 61, coastal states imagine there. EE fisheries in their 200-mile zones, 
uh, should take, are to take measures based on best scientific evidence to maintain or restore harvest populations at levels that can produce the maximum sustainable yield as qualified by relevant environmental and economic factors. So in a way, this is good news, bad news. They put MSY, entrenched in a constitution of the oceans, which has been really badly criticized in the scientific literature, both by scientists, by managers. It's not what we need in a, a, a way, a, a changing world. It, it kind of gets this idea of a fixed, kind of quantifiable thing we can nail. And, but it does talk about environmental and economic factors. And it considers harvest effects on dependent associated species. So it does actually have an ecosystem kind of uh, penumbra around it. And you have Article 119, uh, which provides the same obligation to high seas fisheries, where fisheries go beyond national uh, zones into the high seas. FAO Code of Conduct also encourages elements of an ecosystem approach. Uh, management measures should not only ensure conservation of target species, but also species belonging to the same ecosystem uh, associated with or dependent upon the target sea species. Selective environmentally safe fishing gear and practices should be developed and encouraged. All critical fishery habitats and marine and freshwater systems, wetlands, mangroves, nursery areas should be protected and rehabilitated. Management measures should ensure the protection of endangered species. Fisheries should be managed as a biological unity. And in light of the transboundary nature of many fish stocks, we really have to increase scientific a cooperation to understand you know, these transboundary fisheries which are all over the world and again often not well managed. We actually have obviously I think most people know there are actually a 2003 ecosystem approach guidelines to fisheries and then you just see how it, it, it blossoms out this whole concept uh, of what it may mean and it's just a long list of things that countries and uh, regional fishery management organizations have to consider Establishing MPAs, of course, applying ecological impact assessments to fisheries, reducing fleet sizes, restoring fish habitats, promoting the use of eco labeling, recognizing user rights, including rights of coastal fishing communities. So they actually uh, you know, think very much about the local level of fishing as well and how that has to be dealt with. Uh, developing best, better participatory processes with stakeholders, uh, ad ad adopting adaptive management approach, especially in data poor situations. We've heard about that already the last couple of days, the data poor situation. Moving from single stock assessments and management to broader multi-species and ecosystem modeling and management. Formulating EAF management plans, incorporating ecosystem approach to fisheries and, man and legislations and fisheries regulations. That's another huge challenge. Many countries have not modernized their Fisheries Act. I can speak of Canada. Our act goes to 1868. No objectives, no principles. And they give absolute discretion to a minister of fishes and oceans who is a politician to set the management standards. Now there's all kinds of policies on precaution, some on related to ecosystem approach, but they're policies, not entrenched in law. So to me, this is another huge, huge challenge <coughs> that has to be looked at. Very quickly. Convention on Bonds Diversity Decisions on the Ecosystem Approach. We actually have a couple decisions uh, which talk about ecosystem approach on a broader scale, not just on fisheries. And you can actually find these sets of guidelines, principles from the CBD. I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, and then two bottom lines, I think, where we're at, and this is why it's kind of tacking. Uh, we need to consider and address, obviously, the impacts of fishing on marine ecosystems. And we need to consider and address the implication of marine ecosystem changes on fisheries. So it's a two-way kind of reality that we see emerging uh, at the international level. Very quickly, UN processes continue to set ocean sustainability agendas, obviously. I think everyone's here aware of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, we have uh, SDG number 14 goal specific to oceans, conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. They have uh, basically uh, under that 10 targets uh, under that ocean's uh, goal. And you look at three of them, they actually have sound science. And I just wanted to flag those for everyone. Uh, target 14.3 calls for minimizing and addressing the impacts of ocean acidification, including through enhanced scientific cooperation at all levels. Target 14.5 calls for conserving 10% of coastal marine areas based on the best available scientific information. And then finally, target 14A calls for increasing scientific knowledge, developing research capacity, and transferring marine technology to developing countries to improve ocean health. 
one should note that the first goal is reducing poverty around the globe. And that, in many countries, that's the big issue. If you don't deal with the poverty issue, we've heard already some examples from the Philippines, those issues are, are out there. So again, you know, we're, we're making progress internationally. Um, UN General Assembly processed a few words on those. We actually have had a, um, a, a number of processes looking at biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And this is a huge issue, actually. Um, you know, look at where we are. So over 60% of our oceans is beyond national jurisdiction, beyond the 200-mile zones of coastal states. Over 60% of the ocean, over 40% of our world is beyond <laughs> the, the, the national jurisdiction. So this is a big issue. And so they've been struggling with this now since about 2006. They, they've gone through a number of processes. They had a working group that met you know, for almost nine years or so. Uh, and then in June 2015, General Assembly decided to establish a preparatory committee to develop a draft text of a new global binding agreement on high seas biodiversity. And basically that PREPCOM held four meetings. And in just this year, they finalized the elements of a draft text. And now it's before the General Assembly in the next couple of months for discussion, and they're going to have to decide. Are we going to move forward, negotiate a new agreement or not? And if we're going to start it, what is the process? will probably take at least a couple of years. So keep an eye on this. I'll come back to this. I was in a lot of these meetings, and I'll tell you, all we agreed on was, yeah, we, it's probably a good idea to have an agreement, but there's hardly anything agreed on. So there's some real challenges here. And I'll come back to that when I get into the sea of challenges. And of course, you have the other UN processes also. Annual Sustainable Fisheries Resolutions. You know, I don't think, I, I take one wherever I go. Here's my UN General Assembly resolution from just this past December. But it's important because you know what? Every year they have one of these and they keep telling everyone, states, RFMOs, take precautionary approaches, take ecosystem approaches. And in the most recent one, they say, wake up. Climate change is with us and we have to now start incorporating it into fisheries decision making, build the science, increase the science, so again, this is all coming from the UN General Assembly. It's not binding, but it's uh, you know, our best thing we have in town, pushing agendas forward at the global <coughs> level. Conventions, a few words on that because of time, I do want to get into my challenges. So we have all these conventions. I'm not going to go into detail. Obviously, you have species-oriented conventions and very important for protecting species. You have habitat-focused conventions, including listing of international wetlands for protection. You have the Convention on Protection of World Heri Cultural and World Natural Heritage. We have many natural sites designated, including Australia's Great Barrier Reef, for example. Um, and then I just want to focus a little bit more on the biodiversity, what I call expanded. You have the Convention on Biological Diversity. Again, because of time, I'm not going to go into details, but again, this is a binding agreement. It's only a framework agreement, uh, but they do call for the establishment of, of system of protected areas. This is what's driving networks of protection uh, you know, processes around the globe. And it does talk about preserving practice of indigenous and local communities embodying traditional lifestyles. So again, you see the concerns at the international level about the special indigenous concerns in many countries and also local communities. Uh, I won't go into the details because of time, um, but numerous decisions have followed under the CBD that have been further promoting conservation, sustainable use of biological diversity. We get our famous uh, strategic plan for biodiversity, 2001 to 220, adopted in a decision in 2010. These are the famous Aichi targets. Uh, you have basically 20 biodiversity targets agreed to. And if you look, two are important, very important, the fisheries target six. By 2020, all <laughs> fish and invertebrates are managed and harvested sustainably, legally, and applying ecosystem-based approaches so that overfish is avoided. Recovery plans and measures are in place. And fishers have a significant adverse impact on threatened species and vulnerable, have no significant impacts on threatened uh, and vulnerable ecosystems. Impacts of fisheries and species and ecosystems are within safe ecological limits. So again, this is a huge challenge for science to come up and begin to tell us what are these safe ecological limits. And target 11, of course, by 2020, we need to have 10% of coastal marine areas are conserved through well-connected systems of protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures. And we've had all kinds of decisions. Uh, furthermore, under the CBD, um, one of the things they've done, of course, is trying to identify what they call EPSAs, ecologically and biologically significant areas. And we've actually had the agreement internationally on the scientific criteria that to be used to determine where these EPSAs are. 
uh, and you see them there all the way from uniqueness, uniqueness or r rarity, special importance to life stages of uh, species, vulnerability, fragility, sensitivity, and slow recovery, biological diversity, naturalness, a number of factors, criteria. And we've moved forward then uh, through the uh, CBD process. They've held workshops in many regions of the world, and they've actually developed and identified over 200 EPSs around the globe that should be protected, given special protection. But no, through a decision in 2010, they emphasized the selection of management measures as a matter of, of, for states and competent intergovernmental organizations. That is, in most cases, fisheries organizations. And requested the executive secretary to organize a series of regional workshops then, which are held. And there is a website then where we see these EPSs. So again, you see what's going on here. The CBD does not have legal power to protect the EPSs. It's up to states and regional fisheries management organizations. So governance challenges. I've got 20 minutes. Are you still with me? OK. Am I going too fast? Should I go faster? <laughs> I hope you haven't blinked. Uh, so just because of time, three will be, will be highlighted. Putting sustainability into practice, sustainable principles into practice. So. Um, here I just want to talk about three challenging realities overall. And I want to give you three quick case studies from the, from the North Atlantic. I figure since we're off Woods Hole, you look out on the water, we're in the Northeast Atlantic, uh, Northwest Atlantic, right? So I think I'm going to just give you some examples. And you know, it can get a bit depressing, to be honest with you, because you, you, you see where the science is, how much science we're generating. And then you look at what's going on, whoa. So I'm not going to give you the answer now, what the channels are, but watch out, it's coming. So three challenging realities. One is conceptual confusions. Uh, both precaution and approaches are subject to similar conceptual confusions, definitional generalities, definitional variations, and terminological confusions, and management measure uncertainties. What do, we, what do they actually mean at the end of the day for management? There's a lot of uncertainty about that. So generalities. This is the classic definition of precaution from the Rio Declaration in 1992. It's not in a treaty, it's not legally binding, but this is the one that most states continually refer to. In order to protect the environment, the precaution approach shall be widely applied by states according to their capabilities. Where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty, shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. That is not reverse onus of proof. That is not a strong version of precaution. I would call it a diluted, watered down, bureaucratic, negotiated kind of version. And it leaves a lot of interpretive leeways. What exactly are state capabilities? How do we define serious or reversal damage? What should be the role of science in determining risks? And what exactly are cost effective measures? So you have a lot of room for even disagreement. Equisys approach has also displayed definitional generalities. Uh, many international calls for an ecosystem approach have provided no definition. Just call for ecosystem approach. Everyone shakes their head, yeah, good. Uh, if you go to the CBD on Convention on Biodiversity, this is their definition. Ecosystem approach is a strategy for integrated management of land, water, and living resources that promotes conservation, sustainable use in an equitable way. It's focused on levels of biological organization, which encompass the essential processes, functions, and interactions amongst organisms and their environment. Recognize that humans, with their cultural diversity, are an integral part of ecosystems. Very nice statement. But how do you actually balance the human versus the biological conservation aspects? It's, it's very general, right? It doesn't really give a lot of detail in that direction. Variations are the other problem that's confusing. A precautionary approach has varied definitions. Um, the Rio Declaration calls for cost effective measures. You go under the Convention on Biological Diversity. They have a definition which shows up in the preamble of the convention, knowing also where there is a threat of significant reduction of loss of biological diversity. Lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing measures. It will talk about cost effective measures, just measures. So again, you know, where are we? There's no internationally agreed single definition of the ecosystem approach. Uh, the UN had an informal consultative process, uh, a meeting in the UN, and 2006, uh, where governments and NGOs, et cetera, discussed this whole question of what is the ecosystem approach about. And they concluded there are various ecosystem approaches. They use the plural. There's no single ecosystem approach. 
And you, again, you'll see definitions vary in how ecocentric versus what you call anthropocentric they may be. Example of quite an ecocentric version is from ICES, Comprehensive Integrated Management of Human Activities Based on Best Available Knowledge about the ecosystem and its dynamics, or to identify and take action on influences which are critical to the health of marine ecosystems, thereby achieving sustainable use of ecosystem goods and services and maintenance of ecosystem integrity. So they talk about ecosystem integrity, which is very much ecocentric, I think, in the end of the day. It doesn't mean you don't consider human uses, of course, but it's much more ecocentric. And of course, terminology. Is it precautionary principle or approach? I'm not going to go into detail because of time, but this is an ongoing debate, actually. And to most academics, to most people, no. You go to the Rio Declaration, they say principle 15, and then they go on to use principle approach. End of game, end of, end of story. They're interchangeable. But certain countries and certain circumstances have argued that there is a difference, including US and Canada, when they had a dispute over using synthetic hormones in growing their cattle, and the EU put a ban on it, and then they brought a trade, uh, basically, uh, dispute before a WTO appellate body. And both countries said, no, it's, you know, it's a really approach. Principle gives too much of the idea of it's legally binding. We don't think it's legally binding. So we prefer the precautionary approach. And if you go to the FAO, uh, they always use the word precautionary approach. Precautionary approach to fisheries, precautionary approach guidelines to aquaculture. You never, 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 never see that I've seen ecosystem-based fisheries management. Maybe it shows up in consultancy somewhere. I've given my law students a bet in my classes to say, if you can find where EBM is used rather than ecosystem approach by FAO, I'll give you a million dollars. I haven't paid out yet. So I don't want to make that promise here this morning because there's some really intelligent people here. Uh, and again, you can see what FAO is concerned about. They don't want to have too much concern given to you know, the environment over social economic needs of fishers. And so again, they have guidelines. That 1996, although the precautionary approach of fishing may require cessation of fishing activities that have potentially serious adver adverse impacts, does not imply that no fishing can take place until all potential impacts have been addressed and found to be negligible. So they're very concerned about precautionary moratoria, essentially. They're very concerned about extreme forms of precaution. So they, they use precautionary approach all the time. Um, ecosystem approach, again, to fisheries versus ecosystem-based fisheries management. Is there a difference? Again, most say no. But again, I say FAO continues to uh, uh, ecosystem approach language. I, I think, again, to avoid giving too much weight to biodiversity conservation over social, social ec economic needs and interests. And again, just look at their definition. Ecosystem approach to fisheries strives to balance adverse social, societal uh, objectives by taking into account the, I think that may be diverse, actually, and, and taking into account the knowledge and uncertainties about biotic, abiotic, and human components of the ecosystem interaction and applying an integrated approach to fisheries within the ecologically meaningful boundaries. So they talk about the boundaries issue. They don't talk about ecosystem integrity uh, under their kind of definition. And then finally, there's considerable confusion over appropriate management measures. And with a central question uh, being, when are strong versions of precaution appropriate versus adaptive management? That could be another hour lecture. There's very little guidance on that around the globe. And, and you know, that's a difficult thing where you, where you make that decision. I'll leave it there. And uh, we can come back and maybe in discussion if need be. So practical constraints. Limited finance and human, and human resource research in support of setting reliable precautionary reference points. FAO, in their report from 2016 on where we are with the code of conduct implementation, this is what they found. Only 57% of FAO members reported sufficient personnel to op generate data in support of sustainable fisheries management. Only 41 to 50% of key national stocks are considered to have reliable estimates of stock status. And major gaps include, uh, knowledge gaps include stock status, test data and effort data, ecosystem factors, and level of you know, illegal, unreported uh, fishing, IU fishing around uh, countries as well. And of course, we've already talked in our workshops here, uh, limited scientific understanding of complex marine ecosystems, obviously limitations of scientific mod modeling, uh, and you know, we've, we've heard this already. You know, obviously, there's a managerial need to have the, really the short term. You know, give us a quick fix. What's going to happen two years from now? But very often, models are better at long term scenario uh, predicting, or projections, I should say. Predicting local and regional impacts of climate change. Again, you, know, you can have the global models, but going down to the region and local level is much more difficult, I think I've heard already. 
And then, of course, limited understanding of social ecological systems. And we have a lot of people here from the social ecological systems thinking. But again, you know, information problems there as well. And then the political realities. Um, again, just to be general here, but these are, I, I, I can guarantee this is where we're at. Uh, we, we often see setting high total allowable catches, even where scientific information is lacking or limited. There's often ignoring or ro overriding of pre precautionary scientific advice because of social economic pressures. And there's also very prevalent failure to require, legally require the following of precautionary scientific advice in establishing fisheries management measures. I think the U.S. may be quite unique. I mean, under their Magnuson-Stevens Act, they actually amended a few years ago to require generally scientific advice to be followed. You don't generally see that in most countries, and you certainly don't see it within regional fisheries management organizations uh, overall either. So this is another major uh, political reality. And then political allies have also been uh, uh, also constrained implementation of the ecosystem approach. Uh, management fixation is certainly on standard single stock assessments. We, we just seem to be so much into a single stock assessment mentality around the globe when you look at what's going on uh, both at the national level and regional levels. Moving slowly or not at all in developing networks of MPAs. You know, a lot of countries are setting up MPAs to try to meet that 10%, including Canada, but the networking is often forgotten. We've got to get to 10%, and you don't really see the uh, connectivity that has to be taken into consideration. And then failing to consider ocean conditions and decision making. Uh, a recent study reviewed how more than 1,250 marine fish stocks were being managed and found only 24 where ecosystem processes were included in the tactical management advice. That's an article by Skern Maritzen et al. in 2016. And then limited political interest and in will in subjecting all transboundary fish stocks to cooperative management. This is one of my favorite topics. And again, I wish I had another hour to talk about my favorite topic. But this is the American eel. It uh, goes all the way from western Greenland down towards Venezuela. It's considered panmictic. doesn't have genetically distinct subpopulations. One big happy family. And where are we? There's no bilateral cooperative management. There's no regional cooperative management. We have a Sargasso Sea Commission has been established, but it's a you know, weak commission, really, at its kind of beginning. It doesn't have any real management powers yet. They're concerned about where the eels come down and, 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 and actually spawn in the Sargasso Sea. So we're really here. There's poaching going on down in the Caribbean. Everyone knows it, but it's not really being dealt with. So this is just an example where we really are not managing uh, on an ecosystem basis uh, in many cases. So my three case studies, I think I now have whew, nine minutes. Canada U.S. management of shared ground fish on George's Bank. So they three important commercial ground fish stocks, cod, haddock, and yellowtail flounder, uh, became critical after World Court drew a boundary line right here across George's Bank. So this became Canadian part of the bank. This became U.S. part of the bank. So World Court did that in 1984. And what we've seen is very informal management arrangements established in 1995 to facilitate federal coordination, scientific research, and fisheries management. We have a Canada U.S. Transboundary Resources Steering Committee of federal officials to get together. Transboundary Resource Assessment Committee, where the scientists from the two countries uh, kind of d develop recommendations on the scientific part of the uh, management. And this Transboundary Management Committee, Guidance Committee government industry committee that advises uh, um, what, what should happen in terms of fisheries management. So they came up with the agreed quota sharing formula in 2003, uh, moving from uh, geographical distribution stocks uh, originally at 60% of what you would get based on distribution, and then historical catch giving 40%. And they phased in eventually where now the distribution of who gets what amount of fish is based on geographical distribution. It's probably, I would suspect, to favor Canada over the long term because fish will move probably over that way. Uh, who knows? And then historical utilization goes down to 10% of how you allocate the fish stocks. Uh, and just very quickly, the status of a couple of these stocks are really poor. Uh, yellowtail flounder, 118 metric tons in 2015, lowest since 1935. Cod, 2015, 608 metric tons. And look at where it was before, historically, uh, between uh, 1978, 1993, around 17,000 metric tons, and actually went up to 26,000 metric tons, uh, a little bit over that in 1982. So scientists, I think, it's, I, I think they sound, a, a, I call it a siren sound. Um, you see that article by Pershing in Science back in uh, 
2015, slow adapt uh, adaptation in face of uh, rapid warming leads to collapse of Gulf of Maine cod fishery. So you see, you know, again, the science coming out saying that we've lost really you know, that stock in a, a major way. And then what's amazed me is how climate change received, I think, very scant attention for Jenga, Georgia's bank transboundary management. No explicit consideration in giving us scientific advice. The recommendation of annual quotas simply hasn't gone in. Uh, the track scientists have indicated water temperature may play a role in light of significant recovery, significant recovery of uh, cod in Georgia's bank, along with other factors, including seal and shark predation. Um, scientific uncertainty prevails over whether cod have moved off the bank into deeper water around the bank and adjacent management areas. And then you go back to what's happened in 2014, they had a steering committee meeting. Canadian co chair says, you know, maybe it's time to put climate change on our standing agenda. Every time we meet, we should talk about it. As far as you can see, that's never been followed. And then in, it's very interesting, in a May 2017 meeting this year, the track co-chair came and reported on a holding of a Canada-US ecosystem-based fisheries management workshop in Canada. And executive director of New England Fisheries Management Council expressed concern over the fact that no US fishery managers were involved in the workshop. So again, you see that I think what I begin to show you is sometimes the science is over here and the decision making is over here. And we just don't see them connected, certainly not in the Georgia's bank that I've looked at. Tuna, ICAT, International Co Convention for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuna, uh, has broad coverage and uh, covers tunas, marlins, swordfish, et cetera. And again, it's a long story, but at one point they even called the International Conspiracy to catch all tunas. They really had a very poor record for many years, not following precautionary advice. They have improved in more recent times. But again, even in 2014, you see some questionable quota being set, I think. They could not agree on, on the upper bound for Eastern, Atlant uh, Eastern Atlantic and Mediterranean bluefin uh, because of assessment of certainties. And yet they go ahead and set quotas, you know, here we go, uh, 16,000, a little over in 2015, a little over 19,000 tons in 2016. Etc. So you see actually often quotas being set not based on really that sound of science. There's science there, but it's not agreed on in terms of uncertainties. And uh, ICAT is about to hopefully uh, finally adopt amendments to a convention later this year, we hope, that will actually call for precaution and ecosystem approaches. It's only taken over 50 years, only fi over 50 years, to get to an amended convention for ICAT. So again, we've been moving very slowly. And uh, again, they continually, to, I say, quite arbitrarily manage bluefin stocks as two populations, western and eastern Mediterranean, the 45 degree western meridian boundary, even though everyone knows the stock structures remain largely unidentified and substantial mixing is known to occur. So it's like, you know, we need to manage and let's just arbitrarily set it here. So again, you see the science kind of over here and then the management uh, kind of over in another direction. Uh, and they're very early stage of using management strategy evaluation. This is one of my interesting things that you raised uh, in your presentation. Where are we? My sense is we're quite at the infancy stage in many countries, with a few exceptions, maybe Australia being quite advanced, the U.S. using it more and more. But again, they're just getting around to it, really. Uh, they, they've now set a five-year roadmap to basically uh, use MSC as a way to move forward and develop harvest control rules, but it's very much at an early standing stage. And uh, again, if you look at a... Uh, there's a working group to enhance dialogue between fisheries and science managers uh, that's offered a forum to further discuss MSC and setting harvest control rules. They reported from their 2017 meeting that we have limited scientific expertise and research support, lack of clear management objectives for some stocks, and limited buy-in and understanding of MSC by some contracting parties. So you begin to see the constraints out there uh, that, that come out when you look at these uh, regional fisheries management organizations. And finally, climate change continues to receive very scant attention uh, within ICAT. Uh, you have a subcommittee on ecosystems. It's been largely looking at uh, reducing bycatches on sea turtles, seabirds, and sharks. And environmental, environmental factors have yet to really be incorporated into scientific advice or taken into account deciding national quota allocations. And you, have, you do have some scientific papers from ICAT, which I won't go into detail because of time. Uh, and basically, I want to just come to my last I'll slip over these slides because of time. I want to leave some time for discussion. But just this is an example of what's going to happen, I think, more and more in the world. So what's recently happened is you begin to see the bluefin going up off of eastern Greenland, where they never used to occur, we think because of climate change. And they're going after the mackerel. Never used to go up there either. So this is really beginning to now raise some real management issues for ICAT. 
Uh, this is the catch that occurred off of eastern Greenland, a little over 12,000 uh, kilograms in 2014. It went down a bit in, uh, quite a bit, actually, 2015, and way down in 2016. And it's uncertain whether the migrating tunes are coming from the western and eastern Atlantic populations would appear. And this is really now beginning to raise a problem for ICAT, because Greenland isn't a party. They're not a contracting party to the ICAT convention. Uh, and UN's fish stocks agreement restricts access to highly migratory fisheries to, uh, to members of regional fisheries management organizations. So Greenland now is considered becoming a party to ICAT, possibly under the wing of Denmark, because they're you know, connected to Denmark uh, for its foreign relations. So again, this is beginning to raise real issues for Greenland. I've been told now they're looking at what will happen this year's catch. And if it's way down, they'll probably wait to become a member. If it goes up, they'll probably think about becoming a member. But these are the kind of things I think we're going to see more and more of with species moving, and then it suddenly raises new, new concerns for fisheries management organizations. NAFO. I'm going to skip over NAFO because of time. Uh, but they have set up some uh, you know, vulnerable marine ecosystem protected areas for corals. They've done some things on the... Uh, environmental side, the ecological side, uh, vulnerable marine ecosystems, they've, they've gone there. But again, when you look at what's happening in practice, you see really this barrier yet from moving from uh, the use of climate change science into decision making. It's just not occurring at this point within NAFO. Uh, they are beginning to move to management strategy evaluation. They've just completed a uh, MSE process for uh, Greenland halibut. And so they've made progress there. They have one other cod stock, 3M cod, that are doing an MES process. They want to do one on. So it's, it's on the agenda to move in that direction. Uh, they uh, basically uh, do have a working group on ecosystem science and assessment. And they are working on multi-species modeling. They're working on production modeling, ecosystem modeling largely at, at a larger scale. And so it's all going to go in that direction. But it's all very much at the scientific, you know, empathy stage, I would say, yet. And it's not being translated over into the management of stocks itself. And so, again, just to show example, in 2016, the Scientific Council was unable to advise an appropriate TAC uh, for redfish. And yet the commission sets a quota of 20,000 tons. And they advise, again, a really a precautionary level of a take for skates should be 4,000 700 tons, uh, you know, basically, and yet the commission approved a TAC of 7,000 tons. So again, we, send, we, we, we still are looking very much at single stock assessment, and even when scientific advice is not there or it's uh, given, you see it there being overrided, even under this new approach where you're supposed to take precautionary approach and ecosystem approach as well. Gee, I'm over time. A few words on climate change, however, and ocean acidity. Paris Agreement is not a sure savior for the oceans. Um, you know, this is what we came up with at the overall goal. Holy increase in global average temperature to well below 2,000, 2, 2 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels to pursue efforts to limit the temperature to 1.5 centigrade above pre-industrial levels. That's not a scientific target. Political compromise. And oceans are only mentioned once in the Paris Agreement. Uh, you know, notice the importance of, of oceans, ensuring protection of all ecosystems. It's noted in the preamble. So oceans only shows up once. And mitigation commitments then sound as very discretionary. Each party is required to prepare and communicate nationally determined contribution towards mitigation of successive, uh, you know, mitigation efforts every five years, expect to be progressive and ambitious. And then you get all the shoulds. Uh, we should uh, basically strive to formulate community long-term low ga greenhouse gas emission development strategies. And we should continue taking lead by undertaking economy-wide epsilon emission reduction targets. It's all should. Now, for scientists, this is really important because what, what we see happening, it's a good news story in a way. Every country is going to have to kind of ante up what it's going to do to mitigate. But you know what it's going to take to ante up? It's going to take a lot of public outcries, I think, and it's going to take a lot of scientists come up with a new evidence of what we're seeing. The trends here is concerning, and we have to ante up our commitments. I think that's where it's going to have to go. And scientists have to play a major role in that, including ocean acidity scientists, because ocean acidity has been largely off the agenda, even under the Paris Agreement. And uh, I'll skip over again. You know, and obviously, you got Donald Trump coming in, jumping off the Paris Agreement track. So again, we have major concerns there. 
And uh, basically, we again, science is going to be very important in this because we're going to have a 2018 report from the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change on, you know, if we go at 1.5 degrees, what does that really mean in terms of impacts on our ecosystems? Because we really don't know a lot about that yet. And of course, the IPC has also taken another assessment on oceans and cryosphere and climate change in the 2019 report. So again, this is important for scientists because more and more we need to know more and we need to let that get out there to the public and to decision makers because we really do have to better deal with climate change. And then there's the whole adaptation part of it uh, in terms of climate change. And again, you know, we, we're going to see this now as an ongoing thing. Calls on parties to scale of adaptation efforts on various fronts. We have to engage adaptation planning processes which should follow a gender responsive participatory approach, considering vulnerable groups based on best available science. For, so all countries now have a mandate to move forward with adaptation and involving communities, involving the scientists. So a whole new agenda is being set uh, globally that we have to follow. And so this is our here's, uh, you know, challenges for scientists, you know, how we integrated ocean acidification, climate change into fisheries, aquaculture, species at risk protection, MPA establishment, pollution standards. We probably have to strengthen pollution standards, even sewage treatment standards in many places of the world with nutrients. We were just talking the other day that we may see nutrients, you know, raising methane levels in the oceans. It may, you know, again, have major impacts, or certainly raises ocean acidity in some cases as well. And then finally, I'm almost there actually, I believe eight and a half minutes for discussion. Can we go a little bit into the coffee break? Here, here? Okay, I'll just finish up. So this UN PREPCOM process, you know, the, the high seas, the areas beyond national jurisdiction. And, you know, we will probably see some negotiations. I'm hopeful that we begin next year. Hopefully if the UN General Assembly can agree that we're gonna move forward. But, you know, we really don't have agreement on almost anything yet. One big question is access and benefit sharing of marine genetic resources. Uh, some countries like the U.S. have been very firm that this is a freedom of the high seas, first come, first serve. Many developing countries said no, it's a common heritage of humankind and we, have, we should have some access to those resources and get benefits from ge developing genetic resources. MPAs and area-based management tools on the uh, high seas, again, that's a big question. Uh, are we going to have a new global listing process for MPAs in the high seas? Who can suggest listing? NGOs? Scientists? Uh, will there be a new MPA commission? Environmental impact assessment? Again, you know, we're going to undertake environmental impact assessment, maybe for new cables, maybe new offshore aqu aquaculture operations. So what exactly are the projects that get triggered where they have to undertake an EIA? And who is the watchdog? Is there going to be a new EIA commission internationally that you have to report to? Is it left to the flag states? All these are questions. And of course, capacity building and technology transfer. So conclusion, whew, we're there. So changing oceans under growing stresses of climate change and globalization are obviously driving substantial shifts in both governance and green biosphere research demands. And I want to end with this, perhaps the greatest combined scientific and governance challenge we assure appropriate management responses occur before biodiversity losses and degradations result. Tacking. Tacking has been the reality. And I really think we're going to have to be much more adaptive, uh, more dynamic in how we manage the oceans. And that will also include, I think, a lot of legal reforms around the globe as well to allow us to do that. And I just want to give you the, I mean, I shouldn't do this because of time, but I want to just give you the, I, I, a true story. What, what really moves me is that, you know, this year in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, we've had at least 11 deaths of right whales, one of the most endangered whales of the world, either by ship strikes or entanglement in fishing gear. And so I think adaptive dynamic ocean management is not a luxury but a necessity. And so and just to show you what happened there, Canada put in place very static protection measures. They had uh, vessel rooting measures. Uh, when you go into the Bay of Fundy, they had actually gone to the International Maritime Organization back in a number of years ago to actually move the, 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 the shipping lanes to avoid the main you know, habitat of the uh, right whale. <coughs> and even designated critical habitat down in the southern areas in the Bay of Fundy and off of Nova Scotia. And then only after you had some of the uh, resultant deaths 
uh, did Canada re respond to its credit? They closed some crab fishing areas. They put speed restrictions over here uh, for vessels to slow down, your large vessels, to avoid you know, crashing into the whales. And of course, again, I go on to another story there. One of the, the first violators, actually, guess who the one of the first violators of that speed restriction was? Close? <laughs> Canadian Coast Guard vessel. Canadian Coast Guard vessel. And there was a cruise ship, other ships that violated it. And then, uh, but here's the thing. Unfortunately, science were not able to precisely predict future movements of the right whales. They actually had a, a recovery strategy for the whale in 2014 and a proposed action plan. And they, both of them said, we need, we need better science. We need more science. We know they're, up, they're going up there. We suspect the food system is going up there in terms of their prey. But again, we need more study. We need more study. So that's the reality. And so now we see you know, what occurred. And so I think that's one of our challenges. You know, how do we actually get to where we need to be? And so I think whether future evolutions in marine biosphere research and translation findings will be able to meet the growing number of management challenges remains uncertain. And I think a sea of governance challenges not going to go away. Not going to go away. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for this enormous tour de force, which to me opened up uh, a whole world of devilish details that uh, if I'd introduced the numerous <coughs> environmental law committee councils uh, and groups that David is chairing or member of, uh, it would have shown even clearer how much uh, basis there is to the details we've been given here. I'm open to questions. Firstly, that was a great talk, and it's always good to see someone talking louder and faster than me, so that's, that's <laughs> nice to start with. Um, I, I guess the question which this all raises is the word binding, because every slide has got could or should or aims or et cetera, et cetera. It's really, I mean, you go to nice places, you write these statements, it means absolutely nothing and 90% of the What makes a state impose binding regulations. And I, 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 I go back to my South African heritage where if you're the Minister of Fisheries and you go to a meeting and you say, I will restrict myself, your, your whole point of being the Minister of Fisheries is that you're the boss. And so why is a country going to impose regulations on itself when some other country is almost certainly not going to? Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's really a fundamental, uh, and that's a political reality you're, you're pointing to. And that really is one of our major constraints. I mean, who, who makes the laws? Politicians, elected uh, in most countries, not all countries, but mostly elected officials. So, you know, there, there is the, uh, the, the big challenge. And, and so, you know, it's, it's a common reality to leave a lot of discretion to ministers at the national level. And you even see at the regional fisheries management organizations, NAFO amends its convention. Look closely, though, at how, what they amended. And, then, and you look at ecosystem approach, where does it really show up? It's in the preamble, which means it's not really a binding principle within the treaty itself. And then when you look at the end of the day, uh, the, the commission, which makes the fisheries decisions, again, they're supposed to look at precautionary approach, ec you know, ecosystem approach. But again, at the end of the day, it doesn't say you must follow scientific advice. You know, again, it, it could be based on scientific advice, but it doesn't mean you actually must follow. And there's no watchdog system within an RFMO to say, well, if we all vote in consensus-wise, we're not going to go with the scientific suggested quota. Then again, there's no uh, review mechanism within the RFMO. So there, this is a serious problem, ongoing problem. And I think that's one of our struggles we're going to see, that we, we're, not, we're not really living up totally to the uh, obligations that we think should be behind these principles because of politics. So I wanted to ask something very related, which is, I mean, we've heard a couple of times about the success of the Magnuson-Stevens Act. So why did that happen? And it seems like such an anomaly. Yeah, I'm not an expert on U.S. fisheries law. I mean, I've looked at it. I've you know, read, read through the act. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not really sure. Maybe some of the NOAA fisheries people might give us some of the history, but it's certainly there. Uh, and so, you know, it's a very strong provision. Um, again, you know, I think there's some flexibility, you know, given in all legislation, there's flexibility given. So, again, but I don't know if any NOAA people here that want to explain a bit how it got in there. There might have been a strong push by some of the R NGOs. I'm not real sure. I suspect there was public uh, concern as well. Maybe, maybe we have it over. We can talk about that over coffee. Catch a Noah person. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Yes. 
Hi, um, I'm Rachel Tiller from Sin Devotion, and I was just wondering about the BB&J Treaty, because you said you'd been to many of them. And I was just wondering, are they taking into account change, climate change and changes in biodiversity under different climate change scenarios when they're actually discussing this treaty? Yeah, you know, the, 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 they had the four issue areas they're primarily concerned about, which I had on the, uh, the, the you know, the, the whole question of MPAs, area-based planning, uh, and then the whole access and benefit sharing, capacity development. So those have been the main issues. Um, be honest with you, I think one of the big debates yet is what they, where they go with this whole idea of climate change and fisheries, for example. And you have the RFMO showing up at some of the meetings, and they're not too keen about a new global agreement taking any way of their fisheries powers away. So one of the really unsettled issues is how they're going to relate this whole global treaty to existing RFMOs, existing you know, decision-making bodies. And so that's really another whole area of debate. And it's, we're not settled there yet. I mean, there's a, lot, a real pushback for some of the RFMOs. You know, don't get into our territory. And you look at one of the things they did agree to in principle is you leave the sectoral things there and you don't over impinge on what they do. So to me, that's going to be one of the big questions. I'm a bit baffled how slowly the science gets into policy, so decision-making process. Do you have any particular advice how, how that could be made faster? Who are the stakeholders? What is, how can the scientists make that process faster? Or maybe they cannot? Yeah, that's a good question. I've heard it within the workshop. You know, that's been debated. It came out, I think, yesterday in our, our final session about communication. It's so important how we get better communication. So I don't think there's a simple answer to that. I mean, you have all the different areas of climate change, uh, adaptation under the Paris Agreement, the mitigation under the Paris Agreement. That's one whole realm. And then you got regional fisheries bodies, another realm. So there's so many complexities to this because you get down to the national level as well. So I guess you know all I can say is that, in some ways, we have forums where it's 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 helping the scientists. We have this, uh, you know, the, uh, the the intergovernmental process for look at ecosystem services. You know, th again, I think that's a great opportunity for science to come up with new reports and actually hopefully influence how we even deal with ecosystem service. So there, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is another one where you actually do have scientists involved with even some cases policymakers come, come up with recommendations under the third kind of working group. So there are avenues there already. Uh, under the RFMOs, I think it's more difficult. Probably it often is getting working with NGOs that actually do observe it, a lot of these things and make kind of interventions, that's maybe another way. I think that came out in our working group session I was facilitating yesterday, working more with NGOs, working more sometimes with industry as well, because they may have concerns as well. And at the national level, whoa, then you're into all these you know, different levels of how you may interact. And I think it came out, again, maybe you want to work more with the media, you know, getting out that lead article out there that, uh, and, you know, again, again, the danger I think we're in today, there's so many you know, big, big stories, you know, another, the ice is melting faster than we thought. How many times can the public listen to that and still be concerned? I mean, th there's a danger of too much big stories. But there, I think the big stories have to continue to go out there. And on climate change, very clearly, I mean, ocean acidity to me is really one of the major threats. I mean, this has been my five, five years of research looking at what we're doing under Paris Agreement and, and what we're not doing. And I'm very concerned that ocean acidity has never been taken really seriously in the climate. It was never even hardly considered in the climate change negotiations. My friend from Turkey was negotiating for uh, negotiating on behalf of Turkey, and she's the one apparently got oceans in there at the last minute with some countries objecting, and Ocean of City wasn't really on the table at all. So. Two more minutes. Urgent questions? No, I sit there and I take her chair's privileges, but it overlook anybody. No? Uh, it, I, I, I'm a bit baffled by, on the one hand, there's definitely old science in the law. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a challenge on both sides, right? I mean, the science is often ahead of the, the law, in fact. I mean, and that's what we're seeing around the globe. And the law has to, in many ways, catch up. And when one, of the, one of the things I think we're facing is so many laws are based on, again, let's look what happened in fisheries. You know, our constitution of the oceans entrenches uh, maximum sustainable yield. I mean, they weren't thinking climate change back when it was negotiated uh, up to 1982, right? Yeah. So there it's entrenched, and yet, we seem, I think, largely in the academic literature saying, whoa, wait a minute, it's not a good thing. And it also puts you down this idea of a single species management kind of mentality. It doesn't guarantee it, but it does put you in that mentality. 
So again, you see our problems that we have those entrenched in law, and then you've got to step back. So all I can say is science, civil society have got to get their acts together, start electing the right people who then enact the, the right laws. <laughs> and really, that's kind of where we're at. I mean, coming back to where you started. It's a really tough one. We're in this kind of circle, right? Yeah. Thank you very much.